So are all these good engineers, they're totally up for going back to their standard American diet and seeing if they can put the calcium back for the sake of completeness, right? Yeah, I got I got to eat Wonder Bread and processed <laughs> meat and drink Coke, Coke and uh, I'm going to get that calcium shoved back in there to shore up those <laughs> atheroma. That's, that's the reality, yeah. That, the joke tells the story. Welcome to the Fat Emperor Podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. We're supported by the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity, which advocates a simple CT scan to reveal your CAC score. So know your score and take action to prevent that premature heart attack. Everything you need to know will be right here. Ivor Cummings, fantastic talk at, here at the Real Food Rocks Festival in beautiful, where are we, Lake Windermere. Yeah, the Brathay Estate. Very nice indeed, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely incredible backdrop. Maybe I'll get some pictures that we can share with people how beautiful it is here. Really enjoying the Real Food Rocks Festival. What do you think about this idea of real food versus paleo or keto or anything else that you've seen? It's like people have got to put a name on it, haven't they? And mm. I, I think I do want to get behind real food. Or like Of all the things that I've seen come and go, I think that real food might be the right brand. What do you think? Yeah, well, I'd agree. Real food is kind of all-embracing. So you've got people who are vegan and vegetarian and then even carnivore nowadays, and they're all eating real food. That's yeah, exactly. The That's unifier. the unifying. Yes. Right. So I think like people who have severe disease and they want to change their lifestyle, they might go with, a, with an omnivore or meat-heavy diet. They might go with a very healthy vegetarian diet with the right supplements or mm. even vegan. But there's lots of ways to take away the standard American diet and start resolving your disease. So it would be nice if we were all united in just eating real food, the right foods with the right magnesium, potassium, the right nutrients, nutrient dense, mm. and get away from this kind of uh, faction fighting. I right, think. nutritional bogeymen. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And it's gotten, it's gotten pretty hot there out there because I think people who have ideologies, mm. they are fighting for their corner and their belief system. So. Um, but we might, we might, it might settle down now and everyone just gets behind the real food message, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Talk about cardiovascular disease. Why should we care about cardiovascular disease? Oh, well, yeah, biggest killer in the world, though cancer is giving it a run for its money in the past couple of decades. Uh, but they're all modern chronic diseases with common soil or similar root causes from environment and nutrition, broadly, not so much genetics. So cardiovascular disease in Medscape last year, I remember putting up a slide in Breckenridge, uh, Colorado, and it basically said in Medscape that the rates of cardiovascular disease are going beyond our con ability to control them. That mm. was a quote. And they said, we're seeing rates in 2015 that we decades ago predicted for 2030. So it's wow. a massive issue. And uh, other autopsy studies have shown that from the 70s to the 90s, subclinical or non-diagnosed atherosclerosis, vascular disease in cadavers, uh, was actually falling down, but from the 90s it began to rise again. And now with diabetes, obesity, and all our problems, I it's rising again. Heart disease is a huge deal, yeah. Mm. And have you got a two or maybe five minute elevator pitch? What causes it? We just talked about real food and keto and all of that kind of stuff. And I think sometimes we're a little bit quick to jump to that as the treatment for cardiovascular disease. But can you explain what causes it? Right. Well, the causes, if you look at the causes in terms of biochemically or physiologically, yeah, they're not, they're not food. The, the causes are, one of the big ones is hyperinsulinemia or mm -hmm. high blood insulin and insulin resistance, often resulting from high insulin or other issues. Um, and high blood glucose and particularly spikes in blood glucose after a meal. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that a steady, slightly high blood glucose, maybe not so bad, mm. but big spikes and drops in glucose, which you associate with diabetic physiology, they can be very damaging through glycation and damaging of your cholesterol particles. So the insulin glucose axis and all of that diabetic type physiology, that's probably the biggest driver bar known. Mm. But then there are many other drivers as well. I mean, autoimmune conditions, lupus, arthritic conditions, anything where your immune system is overactivated can have a knock-on effect of damaging your vasculature. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that also. Uh, heavy metal contamination being acknowledged now, the lead over the 70s yeah. and 80s in petrol. That's a disaster, putting that in fuel. <laughs> yeah, and in fairness to the world, they did, they did wake up and they took all the lead out, but it's suspected now that caused a 
the huge surge of cardiovascular disease. Mm. Uh, but in the 20th century, the real rise in cardiovascular disease, besides the triad of refined carbs, vegetable oils, and sugars, uh, there was, of course, smoking from 1900s up to 1970. There was a huge rise in smoking, which drove masses of heart disease. Mm. And a lot of the fall in heart disease or leveling in the last 30 years has been the huge reduction in smoking. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there were medications, procedures, but, but a lot of it was smoking cessation. But now we've replaced smoking with our massive problem with insulin and glucose mm -hmm. in the population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm starting to notice it now, the reduction in smoking. When I first moved to California 15 years ago, it was, there was a huge difference. They'd already banned smoking in public in California. And so you didn't like, uh, whereas before in the UK, uh, you sit down at a restaurant, there could be someone smoking like really close to you. Like, what the heck? It, um, was, it was insane. I mean, everyone was, I was in San Diego working with Hewlett Packard in 1996 and a New Year's Eve 96, they brought in the first ban in California uh, in bars. Right. And people suddenly had to go outside. So yeah, yeah. It's a long time back. But e from the 70s and 80s with the surgeon general warnings, that's where the real drop in smoking happened. Mm. And then you saw the drops in lung cancer following that. And of course, cardiovascular disease began to recover or at least level off. Mm -hmm. It was a huge factor. Mm -hmm. But I agree, it's way down. But now we have new demons to deal with. Mm -hmm. Talk about the glycocalyx, that didn't make it into your talk today, but I find that incredibly interesting. And I have heard you talk about the glycocalyx before, and I wondered where it fits in, in terms of the key risk factors. How do you think, that? so obviously hyperinsulinemia is involved in smooth muscle cell proliferation and all of this stuff that leads to disaster. But I wonder whether the first step is the glycocalyx, but it's still what you just said, right? If you send these these huge glycemic spikes and you're stripping away the glycoprotein layer, then you can damage the endothelial cells. Um, obviously, you don't think it's important enough to go into your talk that you gave today. Do you think that hyperinsulinemia is still more important? Yeah, I think the glycocalyx is a fascinating part of the process. Mm -hmm. And I do have a paper, well, I, I have tens, if not hundreds of papers in glycocalyx now, which I delved into last year. Uh, but essentially, the glycocalyx you know the paper i have that's really good summary is glycocalyx uh, issues are the first step in atherothrombotic process mm. progression so there are papers out there and it's arguable that the very first initiating step of having a problem in your artery is that the glycocalyx is damaged in that area mm. and it sieves or it controls ldl particle access to the inner wall of the artery it controls by uh, a fluidic a me mechano sensor right. moving in blood flow. It actually releases nitric oxide and it brings in inflammatory components and allows them access to the wall when there's an inflammatory problem. So it's like, it's like this slick shield, a non-stick shield, but with loads of signaling uh, yeah, functions. Super it's interesting. amazing. So yeah, if you do something to damage your glycocalyx, and certainly the papers are out there, blood glucose spikes is the classic one. Right. Uh, there's not much research on it though, because it was so delicate, it wasn't discovered until 20 years ago, and there was no real drug to help with it, so it didn't get a lot of focus. Uh, but the glucose spikes is the one true thing shown to, to damage the glycocalyx. Another interesting thing is atherosclerosis is focal. So you can have an enormous atheroma that's gonna kill you tomorrow in your artery, in your tube, mm. and right beside it or across the wall, the, the artery is perfectly healthy. Mm -hmm. And then two millimeters away, you have another enormous atheroma that could kill you. And all around it, the artery is healthy. Interesting. So it's very focal. And there are papers as well which have tied the glycocalyx thinning at branch points right. to the focal nature of where it occurs. So yeah, it's very important, I'd say, and it's a very important step damaging it of initiating that damage to the wall that leads to atheroma and these pustules, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, um, that's incredibly interesting. Um, you talked about uh, cardiovascular disease as potentially having an autoimmune component. Mm. Is it, 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 tell us about that. I wanted to expand on that when you, when you talked about that in the, in the talk you gave this morning. Well, yeah, I interviewed Gabor Doshi, who's course, a, yeah. a bi microbiologist in uh, Hungary, and he does deep research that makes me jealous. Uh, but uh -huh. yeah, more and more it's coming up that autoimmune conditions carry a much higher risk for atherosclerosis. And it's arguable that your immune system over responds when it's chronic. So the immune system responds to uh, insults. Mm -hmm. The inflammation is not the problem. 
it's what caused you to have an inflammatory response. Mm -hmm. And if that's acute, it's perfectly correct. You, you, you get a, a cut, uh, it swells, it gets painful, inflammation occurs, but that's to resolve the issue. So if your immune response is to resolve an acute issue, that's great. Mm -hmm. And it's an amazingly powerful machine. It's a terrifying weapon, our immune system. It, it's just incredible. So if it gets overexcited in a chronic sense, it through many mechanisms can actually enhance the atherosclerotic process. Mm -hmm. So more monocytes, more macrophage, the immune killer cells coming in to engulf cholesterol, entrapment of cholesterol. This whole inflammatory cascade is intended to fix a, an acute problem, but it would appear that it, it is actually making a problem worse when it's continually chronically stimulated. Mm -hmm. So there you have lupus and arthritic conditions and even psoriasis now intimately linked to atherosclerosis progression. Right. A whole range of immune conditions. So in your immune system, the most powerful weapon in the world is overactivated. There's many pathways where it will actually exacerbate the situation. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a, a simple summary. Mm -hmm. Talk about know your risk. How is that message being spread? How well is it being received? Are people going to get their coronary artery calcium scan? I had one done recently and it was a zero, of course. Of I course. Been, I would have been very upset with anything less than a zero. And the reason I say that is because, I mean, you showed in your talk that by the time you've got calcification, you're pretty far down that disease process, right? And it's not necessarily true that there's no disease there. And a zero score at age 43 is just telling me, well, you're not completely screwed, but you're not necessarily all in the clear either. But uh, talk about the coronary artery calcium scan and are people, I mean, are you going and doing talks like you did just now and people are rushing out and getting them done? Uh, generally speaking, yes. I mean, it's a long-term battle to get the message out there because for many political and economic reasons, the scan was kind of fought against mm. by the medical business and pharmaceutical for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And the Widowmaker movie, if people Google Widowmaker CAC, those two words, they'll get a one-hour version of the movie. And that explains all why we have a problem with awareness, mm. um, all the conspiracy stuff, but it's actually true. So that's one problem. So I'm pushing to get out there, and yes, the answer is I'm getting more and more emails, messaging on Facebook, streams of people coming back with their scores, hugely thankful to David Bobbitt and IHDA uh, and myself for getting the message out. Uh, it's hard to quantify exactly how much, but I had a beautiful comment on YouTube recently, and in the UK, on IHDA.ie, the website, all your resources are on the homepage for the calcium scan. The professor is discussing, explaining, but we now have all the scan centers in Ireland, UK, and America, a couple of hundred mm. in an interactive map. And one person came back to me and said they went to the lowest cost in the UK, which we recommend, uh, the Rivers Hospital, and said when he got there, the lady was lovely. They're still at 230 sterling. And she said in the last year or so, they are inundated with oh people really, that's looking great. for calcium. That, that answers my question, right? That It's a one data point, but she was bemused by it. Yeah. Not realizing why. why and I going? think it is, it's been around a year I've been pushing for UK people. Rivers Hospital is the low cost one. Okay. So I think across America as well, it's a pity we don't, like from a corporate world, have the metrics to be right. able to measure. The no conversion rates. But... I think we just know it. Uh, give another quick example. I had a friend in Corvallis, Oregon, in Hewlett Packard. Uh, his name is Hugh. And he wrote to me on LinkedIn. He says, Ivor, my brother is a senior registrar, you know, internal medicine in a hospital here in Portland. And I was talking to him about heart disease. And he says, hey, Hugh, you got to see this guy, Ivor Cummins. This is two years ago. Mm. And he said, Ivor Cummins? Hardly. And he Googled and he's, he said, wow. My brother randomly in America told me I got to see you and he's an internal medicine specialist. So we're getting a lot of that all over the world, wh which is great. And the more doctors know and become aware, the more they can help their patients understand. And direct though to the masses is important too. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this is great. 700 people here with packed rooms for my Oh talk. yeah, it was standing room only. It's great. It's, it's, it's great because this is less low carb keto kind of nerdy. Yeah. Real, real food rocks is real people. Yeah, definitely. And more and more, that's what myself, David Bobbitt and the Irish Heart Disease Awareness want to get to medical professionals and real people. Mm -hmm. the, the low carb keto people, I think mostly have kind of got the message because I'm quite known. Mm -hmm. But how do we get to the masses and right. save the, What's the masses? Next? Yeah, so yes. at the moment you've just got people like me who I think I went through your website 
and found a scanning center close to me in Walnut Creek, California. And I didn't need a doctor referral. I just phoned them up and they said, sure, we'll take you $400 and put you in the CT scan. And that's great. And that was the only, the only people who were there were all there to get their coronary calcium scan. So I don't know whether I should have asked, shouldn't I? Like, how did you find out about this scan? But, you know, are you really going to solve this problem at the population level if it's going to require people watching a one hour documentary and then understanding the value of the coronary artery calcium scan and then going and paying good cash money to get their own scan done or is it you know is this going to have to be well my local gp knows about it and they're going to refer me for a i mean it shouldn't if everybody was doing it like to run that ct scanner it only takes how long does it take to get the scan done it's like it's a few minutes in the scanner yeah exactly and then the machine algorithm calculates the score so there isn't really human involvement right it's super fast yeah and the machines are expensive but that's a capital cost and they're there and all they need to do and they do for many ct scanners is simply put in the software the protocol for right. doing a csc and yeah yeah, I'd agree. I mean, people need to look at it like a couple of hundred euros or sterling or a hundred dollars up to 400. Yeah, so I, mine was actually very expensive because I'm in Silicon Valley and I've heard that it can be as cheap as 150 bucks in, in Denver and Colorado. Has oh, really? Come up okay. Special, yeah. Well, like you said, it's like a fixed cost. So if the CT scanners pay for itself and I don't care, then yeah, well, I mean, it's cost of goods sold is basically zero, right? Yeah, exactly. And the, the thing is, the companies will begin to realize it, uh, that, yeah, you've got to work, you got to work the capital. Mm -hmm. And of, of course, the annuities or, or maintenance is not too big. So yeah, you want to get as many scans and save as many people as you can. But people just need to understand that if you have a high score uh, or a very low score, your doctor won't know. You can look at your cholesterol and your bloods, but that's guesswork. You get a scan, you get a really high score, you're 20 times or more likely to have a heart attack in the next mm -hmm. 10 years. And another thing I like to tell people from a, uh, a really good study, an 80 year old with a low score, is around 20 times less likely to have an event in the next 10 years mm -hmm. than a 50 year old with a high score. So if you just think about that, there are 50 year olds, myriad 50 year olds walking around unknowingly, whose cholesterol looks fine, who have 20 times the risk of a heart attack in the next 10 years than an 80 year old with a low score. Mm -hmm. And no one knows because so few are measuring. Mm -hmm. There is one important point, it's not just myself and Irish Heart Disease Awareness. Uh, the 2018 guidelines, cholesterol treatment guidelines in the US from the American College Cholesterol Card treatment, is that, you're making me like, yeah. cholesterol treatment. Well, it's, it's the mega guidelines for heart disease prevention, so right, it's okay. tied to cholesterol. But the key thing was that in 2018, they took coronary calcification scan and they brought it right up to 2A evidence level. Okay. That's really high. Okay. And they are now recommending, as we have pushed for years, for middle risk people, which is the largest group, to be quite honest. Middle risk means you're somewhere in the majority and no one knows whether you're high or low. A calcium scan will take 70% of middle riskers and take them out into high or low risk because it's actually looking at the disease. Mm. So that's an engineering tool. So ACC, AHI, AHA 2018 guidelines have enshrined calcification mm. and the concept of the power of zero. If you have a zero, even with blood risk factors indicating a potential problem, you're a really low risk patient. And if you have middle risk, blood risk, and they're not sure about medication or preventative uh, treatment or the extent you need, will you come out with a really high score? You're a high risk patient, bang, mm -hmm. the moment. And you can just see that the, you know, separating people out into what their real risk is and getting the proper treatment before they have a heart attack, mm -hmm. that's crucial. We can all jump in with catheters and, you know, bypasses after the attack and one third had died, so we can't do anything. But why go in later when you can use a scan and find out who we need to treat mm -hmm. up front, maybe 10 years before they have a heart attack, mm -hmm. maybe have them never have one? Well, that's interesting. It seems like you would disagree with my sentiment then that it's either bad news or no news. Yeah, the the high score, I get a lot of emails from people, people who got a high score and they're concerned and all. And that's why I keep explaining. It's not the high score. A high score means you now know and you've got a project to do. But a zero score means you know nothing. Well, a zero score knows you have a very low level of disease. So essentially in heart disease and heart attacks, it's soft plaque and the interface between the calcified and soft plaque where most ruptures occur. Mm. The key point is if you have zero calcium, it means you have a very low burden of dangerous soft plaque. Mm. And the higher the calcium score, the more masses of soft plaque you have, the iceberg under the surface. Right. The calcium is the tip. So if you get a zero score, you basically know you have a very low level. Mm -hmm. of 
heart disease, so you're very low risk, and all the data says this. It doesn't mean zero. You could still have an electrical problem of a heart yeah, of attack. Course. You could have a single large atheroma from a, a genetic weakness at one spo spot in your arterial tree, mm -hmm. and we have had a couple of people with a zero score who within six months had a heart attack. Two cases we know of, they both had a single atheroma and completely clear arteries elsewhere. Mm. But none of this takes from the power of the scan. Right. Because right. the scan is vastly better than the blood risk algorithms, mm -hmm. overwhelmingly. In fact, a scan result beats all of the blood risk factors put together and then some. Right. It's an engineering test. Right. Doesn't mean it's 100% perfect because nothing is. But AHA, ACC, it's in the guidelines 2018. It's on IHDA.ie website. You can see Medscape doc there explaining. And it, it, its time is coming, the mm -hmm. next 10 years. The fascinating thing is we're going to see a lot of interesting stuff when we start scanning people. Not only will we save the lives of the high risk by treating them before the heart attack, and we'll also take people off unnecessary meds who get a low score, mm -hmm. that's all great. But we're going to start seeing people with low cholesterol with huge disease. We're going to see people with super high cholesterol with zero disease. As, we, as someone said in the audience today, they, but they must have had familiar hypercholesterolemia and yet zero on the scan. We have many people with, uh, in terms of British units or EU, scores of LDL at 10 millimoles with zero scores. So what's in that in old money? I still think in that's around 400, 400. milligrams. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, 380 of LDL alone, that's amazing. not total, yeah. but they're getting zeros. Now, I often have to stress, that's not to say you ignore cholesterol. Cholesterol uh, values are a very good proxy for insulin resistance. Right. So I want to know your triglycerides. I want to know your thyroid. Yeah, but if, if you change your diet and your cholesterol shoots up, it could be fine, like those mm. people we're talking about who actually have no problem. Or the cholesterol shooting up or the ratio shifting could mean your diet is not actually ideal for you, mm. even if it's low carb. So the cholesterol can be a warning to look deeper at mm -hmm. your other metrics and certainly refer to CAC or progression to be truly informed. Mm. So it's not to say cholesterol is completely rubbish. It's just hugely misunderstood and it should be used as an indicator to tell you to go and look deeper at the real measures mm -hmm. of disease. Talk about how people are handling getting an, a non-zero score, right? So I know Tommy has written about this before. It's not really about the, the absolute score. It's the progression over time. And, and you mentioned that again in, in your talk today. But how do people handle that psychologically when they go get a scan and it, it's not the zero they were hoping for? Yeah, it's a good question because some people are very pragmatic about it. They're very engineer-like and they say, okay, I thought I might get a zero. I'm a slim guy, didn't smoke, and I was eating healthy food pyramid, and I've just got a 900. And wow, so you say, is, that, is that really? That happens. That happens. Wow. And their doctor thinks they're bulletproof. My own sponsor, David Bobbitt, who set up Irish Heart Disease Awareness, uh, his campaign is because he was passing stress treadmills, ECGs, and executive medicals. And he was told he was top 10% of fitness, and he was really focused on health, non-smoking, slim as when he was 20 at 52, and acing all tests. And then he got a calcium scan, he got a 906. Mm. And subsequent angiogram, he had three blocked arteries, 90, 90, 70% blockages. And the reality is, in America, they rightly told him, no stents, no surgery, because you are asymptomatic. Mm. You have very high disease levels, but optimal medical therapy and lifestyle will match a stent. A stent does not stop heart attacks or extend life. It just relieves symptoms. Mm. For people like him who are asymptomatic, now, I'll be very clear, a stent can save lives on the table in an emergency, mm. but the COURAGE trial and Orbiter and the other trials have shown that for decades, unfortunately, they thought the stent would extend life or stop heart attacks, it, it's no better than medical therapy mm -hmm. and lifestyle. And the reason is because you have an extensive coronary tree, and if you go into three narrowed spots, and that's very naive to think that, yeah, the rupture that kills you could be myriad other places, and that's right. why the stent helps in three spots, but it just doesn't reduce the chance of another right. spot. Below. But everybody listening to this will have know someone that's had one put in and have seen the change in, in symptoms right you see someone in fact i can think of yeah. a a teacher that i saw a couple of years ago that was teaching he was like gray and sweaty and just looked terrible you know under the lights and 
Uh, then he was emergency room, had stents put in. He looked great. Like two weeks later, he looked fantastic. You know, all the skin color had come back to his skin and he's like, yeah. oh, problem solved, right? Yeah, in, in crisis kind of mode where you've got major restriction and you have a lack of collaterals mm. because David Bobbitt um, actually had so many collaterals, the heart had widened all the other vessels. So he had full flow under heart actually insurance. Actually adapted to it. Yeah, whereas that guy probably genetically may not have had fewer collaterals that could expand. So he's really suffering the restrictive flow from those mm. major arteries and the stent is opening them up and giving him a lease of life. Now, often people who go in with a bit of a problem, they're also getting medical and other things too so even then it can be a bit confounded and it, there is a placebo effect I this is a bit controversial but the orbiter trial came out last year and what they did for the first time in history is they did sham operations with stents oh, wow to explore if there was a placebo effect with stents now who would sign up for that it was a big deal they did uh, enough to power it and they did a hundred each and the people who went in under anesthetic no one knew who got the stents wow. and incredibly they saw that the relief of symptoms for these asymptomatic or not so symptomatic not too severe disease people 100 each it actually was a placebo effect so they did not see no. a benefit with the stent once you did sham surgery wow so the stent will relieve severe cases but in terms of preventing future heart attacks or death it doesn't really have a role once you use optimal medical therapy, then you get pretty much the same mm -hmm. result. So it's very interesting. But I think with the scan, the crucial thing is, and I, I often use this analogy, I mean, mammograms are maybe not a great comparison because they over-diagnose sometimes, mm -hmm. where CAC just sees what you've got. But mammogram, imagine a woman, instead of going in with a concern on breast cancer and some signs, and they do a mammogram and they find a mass, and then they give treatment, surgery, chemo whatever's needed imagine you said to a woman well we're going to ask you a few questions and look at a blood test and we'll work out your probability of having breast cancer and then they find out your highest risk you smoke and your blood tests aren't great uh, we'll give you a little bit of radiotherapy and that's what happens with heart disease with men mm. and women you basically use a risk calculator instead of just scanning them and finding out if they're high or low risk mm. and years ago i discovered this and i had to pinch myself and to be quite honest christopher to this day, when I think about what I just said, I have to pinch myself. It's just an enormous groupthink that has led to us taking the most serious disease in the world and not using the technology that tells you in five minutes mm -hmm. what, what level you have mm -hmm. and what treatment you need. I have my own biases about why that might be the case, but I'd love to know yours. Uh, I'd say the Widowmaker movie covers everything. Okay. And just briefly, uh, when the scan was discovered, there was huge excitement enormous excitement so the high speed ray gun could freeze the heart like a strobe and see the calcium mm. immediately the business of cardiology got concerned because a mayo clinic study and this is on the records in the movie a team in the mayo clinic which is a very very good clinic discovered that if we scan everyone with this new quick scanner around 50 percent of our people who go into invasive cath that's mm. a massive revenue generator 50% will have zeros and there's no point them going in. If you have a zero score middle age, it's a 99.4% or 99% elimination of a stenosis over 70% being found. Mm. So basically they realized we can have the number of people going onto the table with this invasive sur surgery, which has risk. And the management team shut down the project immediately. Wow. Because 30% of the revenue at the Mayo Clinic was coming from the cat lab. You're gonna lose 15% of your top line revenue I don't think so. Mm. And, and this is not a conspiracy. It's just, if I was a manager there, I would do the same. I'm sorry to admit it. I would do the same. Well, what about in the UK, though? In the NHS, they're not driven by money. I mean, they're they led by America. Oh, America really? leads okay. the world in dietary guidelines and cardiology. All of the US guidelines I told you that put CAC in a 2A, in a year or two, the ESC European guidelines are going to follow. They followed in 2010. They followed in 2016. So to be honest, it doesn't matter if Europe is maybe a little cleverer or a little fairer with these things all of everything in medicine largely still flows from america especially cardiology mm -hmm. so we're kind of caught there uh, the other thing is pharma six big pharma companies back in the 80s were brought in i interviewed the professor who invented the scan and they brought them in and said guys we're going to be able to help you identify who needs your meds mm -hmm. and they did the analysis and said sorry more people will come off our meds who don't need them than will go on them who do need them 
forget it. So mm. all pharma walked away. So this is all in the record in the interviews I've done with these people. Money talks, and it, it's not a conspiracy. It's just I'm a corporate guy for 30 years. I I hate to say it, but I I nearly yeah. I it's just a no-brainer. You are doing your job in your business for the profits and for the quarterly revenues. Mm -hmm. You can't sa uh, hazard that. You know, I, I get it, I get yeah. it, I get it. And it's a business, and the primary yeah. purpose of the business is to make money, and you have a fiduciary responsibility to your investors, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I uh, talk about my chances of regressing my score back to zero. Ah, the holy grail, I think. The holy grail. <laughs> I'm beginning to speak of that. So we made a documentary in Ireland, and we scanned around 45 super sportsmen from the 90s, mm. the big Gaelic football people. And we got a quarter of them with very high scores who needed immediate follow-up with cardiology. And they were all deemed to be healthy, the 45. We found a quarter of them. And it's the same in the population, very high risk. But we got a few to take steps, low-carb, magnesium, K2, you know, blood glucose meter, kind of eliminating all the foods to spike their glucose. And I'm happy to say four out of four we, we intervened with and gave advice to, to have uh, stop progression which is unheard of in the medical literature. Right. So, in oh, you, so you better talk about this, the exponential curve, what's supposed to happen to calcification over time. Yeah, well, heinz nixdorf is the big study, but there are many more. And they said a calcification increase is inevitable, and kind of exponential based on your age, your sex, and your starting score. And that's just the way it is. There's nothing we could do. And LDL doesn't really affect it. Mm -hmm. And serial scanning is not worth it because it looks like it just keeps going up. So what the hell, let's just treat the people and forget about it. Mm -hmm. Now, they're correct. That's what you see in sad, standard American diet eating modern people. That's what you do see. But the difference with our guys was they did something completely different than the standard mm -hmm. procedure. They went low carb and they got blood glucose meter and eliminated, like some of them had to eliminate beetroot Bread, certainly with dinner, was causing huge rises in these people who had high scores. Uh, and they basically eliminated the foods that were a problem. They ended up with low carb. And they took K2 and magnesium. And just some other basic vitamins and minerals are important for someone with heart disease. Um, and we saw two of the four uh, flatten. One went down slightly, which is unheard of, as per Heinz Nixdorf. Should never happen. Right. And one reduced from around 50 to around 25. And one reduced substantially from a 1,200 score at six months. And then at 12 months had nearly doubled the reduction. Wow. And that latter person is being, uh, there's a case study being published by a cardiologist who uh, got wind of it and is fascinated because he also knows about Heinz Nixdorf. And he said, I'm 35 this years in This is not supposed to happen. This cannot happen. Yeah. But here he is. And I've got his scores and I've got it a done at Agio on him. Right. And he just can't believe it. But I've got emails from all over the world now. I have a uh, guy from 3,600 down to 2,600 in around two years. We got uh, guys down from 1,900 to 1,200 and scores of 60 down to, say, 40. Right. So in other words, there is no question this is a new paradigm. Literally for the next decade, this is the biggest thing. Because, you know, Ornish and those got a kind of a grainy resolution of heart disease slight reversal on imaging right this is cac reversal this is taking away all the drivers of the progressive disease mm. and it appears the body actually gently leaches back calcium well that's what i was going to say have you yeah. any idea what's happening physiologically with this calcium that's not supposed to go anywhere once it's embedded in the soft tissue well it essentially like like any scab or any kind of repair process if you take away the driver of it often the constituents just gently leach back in now some people appear to just stop and the calcium sits there like a sarcophagus like a you know just like a scar uh, but it appears that for many people we're seeing that the calcium no longer needed no longer being deposited because there's no disease driver anymore mm. these people are going to get super safe maybe 15 times safer than they were when they were progressing we know that from other studies and it appears the calcium will unsurprisingly actually gently leach back into the system because we sequester magnesium in our bones we take it back out when we need it same with calcium right it, it this actually is what you'd expect take away the disease process and the minerals get just gently reused right right that's that's the bad now some people say Oh, what if you're taking out the calcium by what you're doing and making them softer and more vulnerable? And the only answer is that makes no mechanistic <laughs> sense whatsoever. Right. It could be true. 
Yeah. Like anything could be true. The moon could be made of green cheese. <laughs> But the reality is, <laughs> this makes absolute sense with all the literature. Yeah. The only thing is, it's completely new. Right. That's what's surprising people. It's scaring and shocking people that this can be done. So are all these good engineers, they're totally up for going back to their standard American diet and seeing if they can put the calcium back for the sake of completeness, right? Yeah, I got I got to eat Wonder Bread and processed <laughs> meat and drink Coke, Coke and uh, I'm going to get that calcium shoved back in there to shore up those <laughs> atheroma. That's that's the reality, yeah. That the joke tells the story. How did you find these guys and how did you get them to commit to the program because this is a non-trivial task, right? Behavioral science is a thing and most people you know, they tend to put these things off. Hyperbolic discounting was something that Simon talked about on the podcast recently. And the general idea is that if I say, Iva, do you want a hundred pounds now or 120 pounds in two years? You say, I want the hundred pounds now. Thank you very much. And people do the same thing with their health, right? They say things like, oh, well, I'll just eat the pizza now and I'll get back to my diet on Monday. So we know behavior change is non-trivial, but obviously with these people that appeared in the documentary, was it the motivating, oh, I'm going to be on the telly, therefore I must not screw this up, or do you think there was some other motivation for them? Actually, in this case, we only we had limited bandwidth. Uh, the, the Basically, the genesis of it was Donal O'Neill, who made the Serial Killers movie. Yeah, I know. Yeah, he had an idea to do a, a Gaelic GA football movie with because he has a lot of strong contacts and leverage. And he thought he'd take the biggest 1991 Mead down uh, match. It was famous. Go at these guys in their 50s and look at their diet and lifestyle and, and just do a whole thing like serial killers. But then we started talking and I said, well, how about you included calcification? Because that's going to add a whole new dimension to it. And he mm. liked it. So we discussed and then David, we met with David Bobbitt and Irish Heart Disease Awareness a couple of times, negotiated. And David agreed to give the funding that we we would be required to bring it up a whole level. Mm. And that's what happened. And it, it went up a whole level. But the regression was not really planned. We only planned to get the scores and illustrate how a quarter of these healthy guys... You knew that what it was going to be. We knew. And now they can get treated. They can, they can go on a better diet and lifestyle. The regression kind of shocked us. And the movie version, which is out in November... The half-hour documentary is currently free on IHDA.ie on the top of the homepage. Mm. You can watch the half-hour. But the movie will be much less sport and football clips, and it will be much more the journey of high scorers. And we'll have cardiologists brought in, Dr. Scott Murray from Liverpool, who's president of the BACPR. We flew him to Northern Ireland to get the second scans mm. where we got the reversal. So he delivers the message on, on video. Mm. So it's a really exciting story of hope and reversal it's it's going to be fantastic that's amazing so are you going to get it on mainstream tv am i going to see it on the bbc iplayer uh, well rte was very disappointing in ireland the main irish channel they just weren't interested they weren't involved and we released the documentary for free why is that do you know why that is i i think it's the way they function they have subsidiaries and subcontractors who make stuff they ask for and someone coming in from the side and donald was a controversial figure he set up the gaelic players union mm. the first players union and you know not everyone was happy with him for doing that okay helping the players there's some there's lots of reasons i think i think rt are just very very structured and very stiff mm. in in what what feed channels come to them with with product and it's really tough Mm -hmm. It's the way it is. So I think the movie will be based on a release like Serial Killers and other things, you know, a relatively low cost, accessible platform. We'll see. It's done in 4K video. Oh so well. it's Netflix capable. The guys I was going to say, what effort. about Netflix? Netflix, but these, these will come later because I think they have to go in for some awards and you can't release the movie till you've seen if you the documentary could win some awards it's oh, kind of really? an embargo but but i think towards the end of the year it should be coming out on very accessible platforms okay and we'll see then bbc and all might pick up and realize what a great uh kind of idea concept it has because when you see all these sportsmen we could do this with soccer we could do it with cricket yeah, in, in, yeah, in yeah. africa you could take any team of guys in their 50s still fit and healthy and you could find a quarter of them with big disease mm -hmm. and save them and get them on a treatment program and then if you go the whole step and take a few of them and start 
getting reversal. I mean, this is great television, honestly, and I'm biased, but this is superb television. Yeah, I agree with you, and I'm cringing a bit because the idea of it, you know, having to have, you know, like the, you know, fancy visuals and a fancy f music score and all this stuff in order to get the message out there makes me cringe a little bit. But maybe that's what you've got to do in order to get this message out there to make this Netflix worthy that people are going to download it and watch it in the tens of millions rather than in the hundreds of thousands. I think would be. That's what we need, Christopher. Yeah, now this is kind of a, an Irish flavor, so it'll be watched worldwide, but there is that Irish flavor. What we'd ideally like to see is to get it done with a UK or US mm -hmm. uh, analogous team. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could, they could do it with basketball. They could do it with these, you know, rugby players. It could be done with anyone. And the beauty is, for anyone listening who's interested, the beauty is that when you do sportsmen all over the Western world, you're going to get roughly the same result right. around... 15 or 20% of them are going to have shocker scores and are going to get looked after and treated. And if you properly implement the right solution, as you will, you will see regressors happening mm -hmm. and stopping progression, mm -hmm. which is against medical dogma. That's very viewer worthy as well. So mm -hmm. I just think that this story is a fantastic story and hopefully people who are smart will pick up on it and see how how big it could get mm -hmm. you know with the right production values etc what's the best way for people to help you spread this message if you're listening to this podcast or watching the video now what's the well, best thing i can do i, I feel really but i mean maybe it's just because i'm too closely connected to the industry and we want run a business that help people improve their performance and health using diet and lifestyle advice and so i don't feel very comfortable talking to my friends or even family about what they might be doing to improve their health and performance but maybe other people watching or listening feel differently like what do you think is the best way to evangelize this work to save lives Right, well, on the CAC specifically and the enormous value we discussed, I, the one-stop shop is ihda.ie, irishheartdiseaseawareness.ie, because on the homepage, we've got two three-minute videos, a few of them, very accessible with professors of medicine, professors of cardiology, top people, top of their field, explaining the calcium scan and the value very simply. Mm. And also the new guidelines are there. And, you know, in 10, 15 minutes, you're going to get all of that. Uh, I'd like to think that my podcast, the Fat Emperor podcast, it's great. Yeah, there's a lot of guests talking about all aspects of health. We even had um, myopia the other day and how you can improve that. Yeah. But it's mostly cardiovascular and serious chronic disease. But that series, if you look up and find one in an area of health you're interested in, I mean, already I have 32. Uh, I have fantastic doctors of Professor Robert Lustig. You know, that, that's good for all of the solutions type discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's super hard. You know, I've been thinking about this is perhaps a postscript and a wacky bonus question, but you know, I've spent a lot of time over the last year or two looking at the potential of supervised machine learning to predict something like the results of a coronary artery calcium scan. So if we say that the scan looks directly at the disease, that's the ground truth, as close as we can get to it reasonably without cutting someone open, then could I train a machine learning algorithm to to do a logistic regression and predict the results of the coronary artery calcium scan using blood chemistry, say, as the independent variables. We've had really good results with trying to predict the results of other tests like that. And I'm wondering whether we could do the same. The challenge, of course, is getting hold of the training data, like who is sitting on a big pile of blood chemistry data together with a coronary artery calcium scan. I'm not sure anyone has that data, but maybe we could collect it, right? If, if very possibly, yes. It's not something that's our primary focus because the blood of tests course. will always be a proxy, but, but I agree with you. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a study which pulled together 19 um, studies with calcium results for people and it looked at whether LDL correlated. And the answer was 19 out of 20, it didn't correlate. Yeah, of course, now, I understand insulin, that. Insulin did. So I think if you put together the really best post-meal insulin and post-meal glucose, and you know maybe GGT and ferritin and some of the inflammatory markers, and you put them all together, and you got a really good predictive algorithm, better than the current ones, which right. is cholesterol, I think you'd, you'd, you'd predict pretty well the degree of disease the calcium but you've always got to remember that you can do all that and still if you go in for five minutes and get a non-invasive scan you get the answer yeah so, so what, what so yeah. Uh, yeah you're right so that's 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 the big question is what's the utility of such a test well maybe the utility is what well, i'm going to run this blood test anyway because my gp is running this simple blood test and then if i could train an algorithm to predict the results mm -hmm. of the scan 
Well, I, I mean, know. you would argue just get the scan, and I think I agree. Well, but it could be as as an old boss of mine used to always say, uh, "It's an and." In other words, yeah. he wanted both things, and uh, often that's the case. So you get a calcium scan, but let's say if it's high. What are you going to do and how are you going to track your progress until your next scan? If it's high, maybe in a couple of years, you need to get another. Make sure it's not progressing fast. Mm. If it's very low or zero, like me, maybe seven, eight years later. You mm. don't have to do many. But what do you do in between scans, right? If that's the final arbiter, the scan result, what do you do in between? Well, there you can use blood tra- tests right. to keep yourself on the right vector to have no progression. So you're not going to do scans every month. That's absurd. E- even a high score might come back in two years. Mm-hmm. But in between, you can use blood tests to best vector right. you arriving which, which at your next scan. So even if the... Yes. I mean, so people have done it. We've done it. You can predict mortality using common laboratory tests, right? And yeah. you can hold data out to know how good the algorithm is. And say it's off a little bit, you've got the ground truth plus the prediction side by side. And then you track in blood rather yeah. than doing... a a CT scan every, I mean, you can do a blood test as often as you want, really, and there's no... That's the advantage. It's the between scans kind of uh, vectoring yourself. Mm. It, obviously, it's going to be blood tests or even a really good operator with carotid intimate medial thickness with limited Doppler, like looking at the bulb. If you've got a high score on CAC and you're going to come up with a, with a CIMT that's probably pretty bad, showing some athero in the bulb mm. in your carotid, well, before your next scan, you might get a, a carotid measurement which is ultrasound and easy, just just to see that you're going in the right direction. Mm. So carotid and CIMT ultrasound is very poor for predicting your risk. So it in zero sense replaces a calcium scan. Mm. It's very poor for predicting. But if you're just looking at, okay, I'm at 70 on the carotid, am I at least going to 69 or 71 or am I going up to 74? Right. Again, like a blood test, it could help you keep your ship as much as possible on an even keel until your next scan and enhance your ability to, to have the next scan come back mm-hmm. not progressing. Mm-hmm. So I, I think these are two dynamic, shortish-term tools, and the long-term arbiter, the final word, is, of course, where's my calcium? But right. that's, that's more spread out, yes. Yeah, of course, that's why I use that term, the ground truth. I, I think that the feedback is important, though. It's like, how do I know yeah. that I'm doing this right? When you look at everything else that people get good at, say the game of tennis, for example, you find out pretty quickly whether you're doing it right or not, whereas... Mm. Whereas With health and performance, it's like way harder than that. Yeah, and Christopher, if we curl back to how we started the conversation with all the different ways of doing it, like a healthy vegetarian or or possibly mm. even a carnivore or omnivore, or do I take more olive oil or do I eat loads of fish? You know, you need to decide, well, how is my diet working for me? And that's where blood test comes in. You don't mm-hmm. wait for a calcium scan in three years to see what your <laughs> diet ideal. <laughs> I guess that last yeah. five-year period didn't work. I need to yeah. think again. Oh. Right, well, I can't go back three years now and start eating this and stop eating that. I've done it. So, yeah, blood test to keep you, you know, in a good vector until your next scan. Mm-hmm. I think that's fair to say. Mm-hmm. Well, Ivor, this has been fantastic. I very much appreciate you and the hard work that you're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will, of course, link to the websites that you mentioned, including your own. Everybody should be listening to the, the Fat Emperor po- podcast by now. I think you do a fantastic job with that. Oh. Is there anything else I should link to in the show notes for this episode? No, I, uh, but I'd say the key one really is ihda.ie because we revamped the website, all the resources there for someone who knows nothing within 10, 15 minutes That's to great. grasp it. So, and then all the scan centers in America, UK and Ireland are more expanding every week an interactive map with all the scanning centers. That's a huge facility that was nowhere available before. Mm-hmm. Find your local scan center. Yeah. And then tell us when you, f- you get a re- regression in your score. I think that'd be fantastic oh. to collect up all of those so it's not just like a single case study, you know, like, oh, yep. okay, it's like ri- well written up and it's not a controlled trial, but yeah, you, c- you get might get to the point where like it's, it's undeniable that you've, you've, you've encountered something that works. For sure, Christopher. I mean, one of them is a black swan and you might argue against yeah. it, but even one of them would be hugely interesting. But we've already got tens. Right. And in the coming years, we'll have hundreds. And once you have hundreds of regressors that conflict with Heinz Nixon, yeah. you, to be honest, you can ask for an RCT, but there's no need. Yeah. Even a dumbass will realize this is possible and it can be done. Wow. Yeah. I, I want to get into this. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Thank yeah. you, Ivor. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Christopher. Great, great stuff. Bye now. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen, a free viewing of the Widowmaker movie on the far right, and myself and Dr. Gerber's book, Eat Rich, Live Long, on the left. Otherwise, please do subscribe to the audio podcast. Thanks.